Hello and welcome. Welcome to How to Enjoy the Journey of Mothering. So I would love to begin by playing a little word association game with you. I want you to just sit back for a minute and I'm going to say a word or a phrase and you can think or write down the first thing that comes to your mind. So you ready? Okay. Being a mom. Motherhood. Taking care of kids. Raising kids. Okay, so I am willing to bet if we were in a room all together right now and I asked you all to say the words that came to mind, you would get like this great big spectrum. Everything from like really fun, joyful, loving to grueling, endless, hard, right? And that's really what motherhood is all about. Motherhood is, we all love our kids so much and we know that watching them grow and develop is really like a deep joy in our lives. But you know, when you're buried in pampers or, you know, tantrums or homework, sometimes it just doesn't feel like that much fun. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to enjoy the journey of motherhood. Because they say for moms that the years are short, but the days are long. So how can you make those long days feel more enjoyable to you? So my name is Sheila Kamara Hay, and I'm an ecstatic birth advocate and trainer. And so what that means is I like to raise awareness among women that childbirth is a journey that they can enjoy. And I like to help them prepare to do just that. So I am by no means a parenting expert, but look around me, I want you to see, I am in the thick of it. I'm in my kid's playroom at the moment, and I have three kids of my own, six, eight, and 11 years old. So I've been there, I get it, I know what it's like, and um, the piece that I really want to share with you is I noticed with myself and with a lot of the people that I work with, training for an ecstatic birth gives you like a unique blueprint for navigating motherhood. There's a lot of tools that you learn when you're preparing to have an enjoyable birth experience that you can actually reach for when you're a mom and you're just having a hard time and you want it to be more fun, you can reach for those same tools. So that's what I want to talk to you about today. First big idea, which is that birth is the sprint and mothering is the marathon. So in the world of childbirth, there's a lot of talk about preparing for birth as if you're preparing for a marathon. And it really is. It's an intense experience and it really challenges your mind, body, and soul. And to enjoy it, you do need to prepare. And I'm a big, big advocate for conscious uh, birth prep and fully like preparing yourself for birth. However, I want to point out that birth is finite. You're going to give birth and then you're going to move on. So it only happens for like a blip in the grand spectrum of motherhood. Whereas mothering is really going to last you hopefully for the rest of your life. So mothering is the real marathon here. And so a lot of the things that you learn when you're preparing for birth are also great, as I mentioned earlier, for preparing for motherhood. So what, some of the things we look at when we're preparing for an ecstatic birth is how you live your life. What are your patterns? How do you, how do you approach situations that might be challenging for you or difficult for you? How do you react if something doesn't go to plan? How do you support yourself through periods of intensity? These are all questions that we really raise and get conscious and talk about in ecstatic birth prep. And as you can see, these are all directly relevant to motherhood. How are you going to support yourself through this intense yet incredible experience? The first thing you need to learn is the dance of creation and reaction. So that's the second big idea we have here. And what this dance is all about is there's a rhythm to everything. There's a rhythm to life. There's a rhythm to birth. In birth, it goes like this. It's a contraction and an expansion, a contraction and an expansion. And you learn when you're preparing for birth that you're gonna get a break. After every uh, period of intensity, you're gonna get a break. And if you can really just like ride that wave and relax, that break will give you so much bliss and restorative energy. So that's one of the things like birthing women really always are reminded of when they're in the midst of intensity is it's finite, it's not gonna last forever. And the same thing in your experience with mothering with your kids, nothing is going to last forever. The only thing 
that is constant, as they say, is change. So that is a comfort right there. And so we, one of the things I want to talk about is there's this dance in mothering between and in life between creation and reaction. So for example, if you are as a mother always reacting to your child, always running to meet the need, their needs and wants and trying to serve them as best as you can because we really want to do that as mothers. We want to, we want to do that for our children. But only reacting to your child in that way, it's going to leave you feeling really depleted, like you're being run around a little bit. So we talk a little bit about creation too, right? So um, for example, a lot, of, uh, a lot of newborns and infants develop like a witching hour, right? Around like five or six o'clock at the end of the day when it's not quite bedtime yet, but they're pretty done. They're pretty done and they just want to be held and they just want to be soothed. And for a lot of moms, that's really intense because you know what, like as a mom, you're tired too. And you're trying to, you know, maybe you're managing other kids, you're trying to get stuff done, or you're just having a hard time having the baby on you all the time at that part of the day. So if you're reacting to your child and you're just trying to soothe, 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 after a while, it's going to get really wearing, it's going to get really depleting. So you can look at it as like, okay, well, how can I create a better experience for us both? If you know that that witching hour is coming, you can start to play with different ideas to create the experience that the two of you are having together. So if it's just the two of you, you can go out for a walk together. You can put on the Bjorn, you can put the baby in the stroller and go out for a walk and really have like a restorative period for the two of you, something that's soothing for both of you during that period which is very difficult or if you have other kids one of the things I did when I had my third baby and my third really like she really had a witching hour was um, and I couldn't hold her because I had an older one that had to do homework and a little one that had to have her needs met, met too one of the things I did was I emailed friends and family I said do you want to hold a baby like come over at this time and it was genius because they would show up they would hold my baby my baby would have like her needs met. She was soothed and supported. I was able to get some pleasure in connecting with a friend or a loved one to have them there in my home. And I was also able to deal with the other kids. So this is the act of creation in motherhood. So when you see sticky spots or you can think about, well, how can I create a better experience for us both? So, and that said, then that comes back to reactions because what if you plan, I don't know, an incredible evening or an incredible outing and your child develops a fever or throws a tantrum in the midst of it? Or, so then you go back to, well, how do you react when things don't go to plan, right? Do you, does it really like set you off into a downward spiral or are you able to kind of dance with it and play with it? So there's this constant interplay uh, in motherhood between creation and reaction. And it's like, um, it's the flow of like, energy inward and outward, the same thing as in birth, the expansion and contraction. And that's really the dance of ecstasy in general. If you look at a body in orgasm, that's what it's doing too. It's expanding and contracting. The energy is flowing in and out. We have these different models of like yin and yang and feminine and masculine energy. So there's always this dance. So the first step really is to realize that that dance exists and then to start to learn to move with it. The next big idea is that you are each other's teachers. So as you can see in the previous example, uh, it's also a dance between you and your baby, right? Like, so you can create as much as you want, but it's not all in your hands. The two of you are co-creating together. And as much as you are your baby's biggest teacher in life as their mother, they're also your biggest teacher in life. There is so much that they're teaching you in every moment, from the moment they're born and your heart expands bigger than you ever thought it could to patience, right? Patience, yes, I will redo that book one more time, yes. <laughs> so your baby is constantly teaching you and um, that shows up as like, they can trigger you in different ways, they can push you to your limits and you wanting what's best for your baby, really wanting to be there for them as best as you can are always kind of growing and learning and how you can be better and be more present and be more patient and be more loving for your child. And this can start as early as, you know, before you even conceive your baby. I had one of my children really like really, really pressed me before I could conceive her. I went through a series of all kinds of experiences, really like loss and um, struggles. And at the time it was 
really tough. It was really tough. Um, and to get through that journey, I had to grow and learn and stretch in all kinds of ways and heal a lot of stuff within myself. And once I did that, I was able to get pregnant with her and have a beautiful birth with her, no problem. But it was almost like on a soul level, she was pressing me to learn and to grow and prepare for her. And so even though it was really a dark period in my life, it's a period that I'm really grateful for, for the gifts that it gave me. And so this, you know, this is how it manifests with kids is they can really press you into your dark corners. They can really bring up the stuff inside yourself that you didn't even know was there. But if you can keep in mind that they're teaching you, that they are your teachers, then it makes it all less difficult. Like it, you understand more that it's a learning experience. And even when it's tough, you can find the gratitude for that experience. Even if you know, you're in the midst of something that feels difficult, you can start to feel grateful because you know that there are gifts in there for you. And as your children grow, it's not just what they do to you, but sometimes witnessing them on their journeys is a growth experience. So as you witness them in different phases of your life, it can bring up stuff from your own childhood, from your own adolescence that you had kind of like left unresolved and it comes up and you feel intense emotions. Well, this is your children really like pressing you to grow, to heal that stuff. And so who you are as you become a mother, you know, whether it's one child, two child, three children, it's gonna change, it's gonna evolve through time. Motherhood is really that growth journey and your children are your teachers. Big idea number four, above all, you matter. So yes, your baby is so delicious and so special and so important to you, but they are not more important than you. In the relationship between you and your baby, you have to put yourself first, you have to take care of yourself, you have to put your joy in the forefront. Why? Because your baby is feeding off of you. Your baby begins life in your body, and then once it comes out, it is dependent on you. So if you are depleted, cranky, undernourished, tired, you're not going to be able to give your baby as much as if you are really sustained and taken care of and joyful. So the more you give yourself, the more you will have to give to your baby. This is kind of, um, this is like the airline model of the oxygen masks, right? They always say, put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on your child. Well, why is that? If you're passed out on the floor, you can't take care of your child. So this is the same thing. And you know, in birth, a lot of women will say to me, Sheila, isn't that selfish to think about my pleasure when I'm birthing my baby? Shouldn't, uh, you know, isn't it just like getting the baby out and the baby being okay? Like, why should my experience matter? Well, you know what? In birth, if you're dealing with recovering from surgery postpartum or physical trauma or any of that, you're not going to be able to be as present for your baby as if you are feeling whole and healthy and happy and empowered. So your experience really, really matters and it really affects your baby. And there isn't a person on the planet who if you ask them, you know, would you be happier if your mother was happier? Who would say no? Everyone would say, oh yes, like if my mom was happier, because even as adults, we still feed energetically off of our mothers. So I really wanna put that front and center. I want you to put yourself first. And if that feels selfish to you, just tell yourself it's okay, you're doing it for your baby. Big idea number five, seize the reins of your experience. In childbirth, a lot of women will talk about the doctor delivering the baby. That's like a very passive way of viewing your role in this whole thing, right? You are birthing your baby. The doctor is there or the midwife is there in support of you, in support of your journey and to step in if you need help. They are not delivering your baby. So that is just kind of like an inkling into our cultural model of how we hand over our everything to experts. Now there are a ton of experts out there that can help you, um, a ton of experts that can tell you about like taking care of yourself, about being a woman, about being a mother, about parenting. There's so many experts and you know what? Like they'll all tell you a million different things. Nobody has lived your life. Nobody has lived in your circumstances. Nobody has had your experiences but you. And so you are the one that um, really holds the reins to your experience. 
So I really want to put you front and center as the expert. You can listen to whoever you want, um, but always go back to yourself and say, does that feel true to me? Does that feel real to me? Does that feel right to me? And similarly with your baby, nobody knows your baby like you do. Nobody knows your child like you do. Nobody has been there present for your child the way you have as a mother. So that's your role as the mother to really step into the fact that like you are the expert on this child. And yes, you can go to this doctor for a consultation or ask this person's advice on how to deal with the situation. Definitely soak all of that in. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't feel right for you, it's probably not right for you. There is no, there's no right or wrong answer is what I'm trying to say. There, it's only what's right for you. And it's important for you to know that you are in control of this experience. Now, I am the first to admit that I have my days when I call my husband, I'm like, when are you coming home? You know, like, when? Or, mom, like, can you come over and help me, right? So, but it's really important to realize that, like, your husband, your mother, your friends, nobody can come and save you from this thing called motherhood. Like, that is your experience to really own and take control of and to make the best possible experience for yourself that you can make. How do you do that? How do you navigate all of this stuff? How do you really own it? So the key to that is your inner wisdom, like really learning to tap into your inner wisdom, learning to listen to that voice inside of yourself that will tell you what is right for you, what is right for your baby. And that is our next big idea, which is that body connection is the key to hearing your inner wisdom. So your body is really wise. Your body has so much information. It has all of your emotions, thoughts, memories, um, even like the mental information you have, it's all integrated in your body. And in birth, you can't think your way through childbirth, right? That is a full body, like primal experience. The body leads the way. And a woman who is really attuned to her body can, um, can, can listen to it and um, have it having it lead her in her birth experience. So similarly in motherhood, your body is the key to your intuition and you just need to learn how to listen to it. So the first step is understanding that the language of the body is sensation. Sensation is the language of the body. So you can stop at any point. We can do it really quick right now. If you want to just close your eyes and take like really deep breaths and relax deeply into your body and start to notice what it feels like in your body, your toes, your knees, your belly, your fingertips, your head. Start to feel the sensations in there. And you can ask your body, what do, what do I need right now? What do, what do I need? and listen to what it has to say. So you can open your eyes. So for most people, what it will have to say is something like, I'm hungry, I have to pee, I'm tired, right? Because these are like your basic primal needs. And unfortunately for a lot of us, you know, we treat our bodies as like this thing that moves our head from place to place. Um, but our body is its own, is our, you know, it's our home. We have to take care of it. So the first step is making sure as a mom, your primal needs are met. Make sure you're fed. Make sure you're getting rest. Make sure you pee when you have to pee as best as you can. We all know how challenging it is, but you need to get your primal needs met. The more you practice that, like really feeling into your body and asking it what it needs, the more you'll begin to move beyond your primal needs and you'll start to get other messages. So that is a really, really powerful practice for moms. And you could do that every morning when you start your day or when you feel like you're just like ripping your hair out, you don't know what to do, you can pause and do that. Like, what do I need right now? Just center yourself and ask your body. Um, the other practice that I really, really encourage as women is to pay attention to how you feel, right? Because that's also the sensations in your body. How do you feel? So if you're making a big decision and you're weighing two different options, there's a lot of knowledge and you can ask yourself, well, what makes more sense, which is how most of us operate. And that's a good place to start. But ultimately where I would like you to go is, well, which one feels better? Which one feels better in my body? And then you're tapping in again into that inner wisdom and that intuition. Our next big idea is I want you to consciously use pleasure as a tool. 
So in ecstatic birthing, we talk a lot about like, how can you use pleasure to have the best birth experience possible? How can you integrate pleasure into your birth to manage the intensity of sensations? So motherhood is no different. I want you to start getting to know what's pleasurable to you. Like, what do you enjoy? What are the things that you enjoy? And it could be like really simple pleasures like, um, you know, picking up a nice coffee on the way to the playground or, you know, cuddling your baby and sniffing in their delicious, yummy newborn scent several times a day. But start like getting really clear about like what gives you pleasure and start sprinkling it throughout your day really consciously and really intentionally. And that'll start to feed you. You'll find that you have more patience. Uh, pleasure is very nourishing and um, it'll support your journey. And when you see that um, you are in a period of intensity, when things are just really intense between you and your child, you up the ante on the pleasure. So for example, I had a little girl who would yell and scream and yell and scream when I washed her hair. Like hissy fit, like red face turning, screaming, would just have such a hard time with me washing her hair. And this is at the end of the day, and I'm tired, and I don't need patience, and I tried my hardest, but I found that I was having a really hard time being patient in the midst of all the screaming. So I thought to myself, okay, how can I integrate pleasure into this experience? So just for myself, actually, I was like, let me try singing through it just to help myself with like the intensity that it was bringing up in my body, her screaming, to soothe myself. So I started singing to her and you know, I'm not gonna say that she stopped screaming, she definitely kept her screaming, but the singing for me soothed me, calmed me, kept me centered so I could be more patient and loving and present for her as she was going through this difficult time of washing her hair. Now, it's really interesting because the song that I used to sing for her, which was that Beatles song that goes, close your eyes and I'll kiss you, is one of her favorite songs to this day, despite the fact that she really only ever heard it when she was yelling and screaming. So it just goes to show that, like, again, you filling yourself with pleasure, you soothing yourself, you meeting your own needs and for me it was like ah stop screaming but the singing helped me deal with that and it the pleasure that it gave me helped me get through those moments of intensity another really quick example is my girls are 14 months apart and when they were really little that could be really really intense at times so what i decided to do is put them in pigtails i put them both in pigtails because they were so incredibly cute and pigtails so just seeing them like that it like up the level of pleasure I was getting from interacting with them so again I could be more loving I could be more patient because I was taking pleasure just from the sight of them in pigtails now there, there will be phases in your children's life that are more difficult than other phases so I want you to think about pleasure not just in the moment day-to-day -day interaction with your child, but if your child is, let's say, in the midst of their terrible twos and you're just ready to rip your hair out, or your child is an adolescent and really like pushing back on you, those are moments when you want to kind of take a step back and fill yourself with pleasure in other ways outside of your relationship with your child so that when you come back into the relationship with your child, you will be sustained. And again, you will have more to give them because you will be coming from a full, happy, contented place. Um, now, the trick here is it's all about oxytocin, right? That's our next big idea. So oxytocin is this yummy, delicious hormone that courses through your body. Um, it's known as the hormone of love and bonding. And you get oxytocin um, in huge doses after childbirth, but also during childbirth. It helps with the progression of labor. But just in general in life, like when you're breastfeeding and you get that like calm, like meditative, like drowsy state, that's oxytocin in your body. Or when you sit with a friend and have like a heart to heart over some tea, that like warmth, uh, that love in your body, that's oxytocin. Um, after orgasm, that like bliss pulsing through you, that's oxytocin. So I really, really want you to get to know oxytocin because oxytocin is kind of the antidote to cortisol, which is the stress hormone. So we all know as moms, that mothering can be stressful. There are plenty of times when we've got all that cortisol running through our veins. 
the more you get to know oxytocin and how to trigger it in your body, the more you can consciously bring that into your body. And the best, the very best way for a woman to do that is to embark on a sensual expansion journey, which is actually what I tell every woman who wants to have an ecstatic birth. I'm like, I want you to start a sensual expansion journey because you will learn how to bring pleasure into your system and how to bring oxytocin into your system, which will support your birthing. It'll also support you as a woman in general. Um, a lot of women postpartum are so focused on caring for their babies that they lose that like connection to their own bodies. They're not interested in the relationship with their husband physically. And that's okay. It's just a different phase of life. But sensual expansion will serve you in being able to access more pleasure in your body, being able to like get that oxytocin flowing through your body. And then it'll also just, um, oxytocin is a very contagious state. So if your child is going through like something that's intense, you being able to have oxytocin flowing through you, you can help them in that state. So, you know, with your child, like a lot of us will, kids screaming and you just want them to stop, right? You just want this child to stop. Um, I'd be like, here's a lollipop. Phew. Thank God you stopped screaming, right? And that does work. I'm not going to lie. That definitely does work. But things like cuddling, hugging, eye gazing will help your child stimulate oxytocin in their body. So you can help them also learn how to soothe themselves and calm themselves by using this hormone. And then you might even have like the juicy side effect of feeling turned on even as a new mom, which will help your relationship with your partner. Big idea number nine, please don't try to do it all yourself. Trying to do everything yourself does not prove that you are strong. All it does is really make you weak inside. Like mothering is really a, a huge journey. And the more you try to do everything yourself, the more depleted you will be and you will be weak inside and you will feel like you're going to crack or break. And no, uh, no baby can benefit from that. No baby can benefit from a mom that's like depressed or, um, you know, dealing with anger issues or resentment or any of that. So don't try to do it all yourself. And this is like really a big tenet in ecstatic birthing too, because, you know, studies have shown that for a woman in the midst of labor, having a doula there will reduce your risk of complications by up to 50% and will drastically shorten the length of your labor. So this is just having the presence of support. There's this moment in every birth known as the transition. And transition is right when your first phase of labor is ending and you're about to start pushing. You go through this transition where you think to yourself, I can't do this anymore. Like you doubt yourself and that's totally normal. And the irony is it's because your baby's about to come out. You're really, really close. So having a doula there eliminates a lot of that struggle. You know, most women will get through motherhood whether or not they have support. And most women will get through their births and through their transitions whether or not they have support. But having that doula there, it eliminates a lot of the struggle and it makes everything a lot easier and it holds space for your pleasure and your enjoyment of the experience. Same in mothering, like having that support there for yourself gives you space and it, it actually like bolsters you. It makes you stronger. So it's, it's this misconception that, oh, I'm not strong enough if I have to ask for help. It's actually the opposite. If you don't ask for help, you will be like all crumbly and weak and inside. But if you ask for help and you have support around you, that'll actually bolster you up and make you stronger. So the last piece in this grand analogy between ecstatic birthing and ecstatic mothering is I really want you to be as gentle with yourself as you would with your child. And the reason for this is, right, you love your child. You want the best for your child. And your child is watching you, right? Your child is learning from you how to live. So if you are beating yourself up over X, Y, and Z, well, ultimately, that is how your child will learn how to deal with, you know, making a mistake. Or, um, you know, if your child is taking his or her first steps and falls down, what are you going to do? Are you going to yell at your child? How could you fall? I can't believe you just fell. Like, why didn't you make it across the room? No, no mom is going to do that. Are you nuts? Every mom is going to be like, yay! Right? They're going to celebrate 
every step and every ounce of how far their child has come, right? So I want you to do the same for yourself. Motherhood is your growth journey. You are growing too. You are learning too. And so just like there's no child on the planet that started walking and didn't fall down, there is no mother on the planet that doesn't like fall flat on her face repeatedly as she's learning how to deal with this like incredible thing called motherhood. So that's the first thing is like really understand that your child is going to learn from you how to treat themselves, how to take care of themselves. So how you take care of yourself is how your child will ultimately take care of themselves. So just make sure like how are you treating yourself? Like are you feeding yourself mind, body, soul? Are you nourishing yourself to an extent that you would be proud if your child did it to that extent too? And if it doesn't feel like it's good enough for your child, then it's not good enough for you because that's what you're giving your child. Um, and I think that's really, that's really everything I wanted to share with you. Um, if you want to hear more about what I'm up to in the world of ecstatic birth, I have several classes here at Entheos that you can check out. And I also write and blog about all of this on my website, which is ecstatic-birth.com. And I, I really, um, I'm really intrigued by this interplay between birth and life and mothering and how you can enjoy it all. So I hope that this class has been helpful for you and I hope that you enjoyed it. And I'm really, really grateful to you for being here with me today and joining me on this journey.